How do you refute people who say God repents uh, by taking f- scriptures like Genesis yeah, Genesis 6, 6, Exodus 32, 14. Okay. Yeah. What's the problem? What, uh, do, they, what do they have a problem with? Well, they, they say God repents. Okay. So what are they trying to prove that God repents? Okay. Say, number one, you're misapplying the passages. God okay. repenting is not the same as the passages of God repenting is actually proof that God is consistent. Now, you guys got to hear the answer. You got to learn how to respond to these passages. It's actually a proof that God is consistent and God cannot go against his nature because these passages do not teach what they claim they do. They're teaching a different point. So read for everyone Genesis 6.6. 6. Uh, give me one second. Yeah, you don't need to mute your mic if you're not driving. Genesis 6. Okay. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on earth, and it grieved him at his heart. Okay, so notice it says God regrets that he had made man because of the condition of man, and it grieved his heart. Now, let me ask you a question. Should God remain indifferent and be unaffected by the evil and corruption that mankind spread? No. Is God a real being with real emotions, and does God really interact with his creatures? Um, yes. So why would you be surprised that when men corrupt themselves and spread corruption, that God now expresses how he feels about the situation? That God is really grieved, really angered, and displeased with the evil condition of mankind. Because the word regret also means he grieved. Nacham means grieved. It pained his heart to see the evil condition of mankind. So should God remain indifferent, emotionless? Because that's not the God of Scripture. The God of Scripture is not a God who's emotionless. Right? God generally loves. God generally rejoices when a sinner repents. Right? Yes. But at the same time, God is truly angry and truly hurt grieved and hurt by sin okay, we got that yes uh Sam, can you repeat that uh hebrew word that you said um Nacham. yeah okay okay yeah you don't even need to do the hebrew this is just my point you get it right yeah and i guess um and i totally understand you i guess because when i was in the cold we were taught a different definition of repent um yeah so... repent means in this context repent means he was grieved he was pained Okay. He grieved and was pained at what man ended up doing on the earth. The Bible clearly depicts a God who has real, genuine emotions. He really, genuinely loves. He really, genuinely is glad. And he really, genuinely gets anger and is disgusted and he grieves. Because he's a God that truly involves himself with his creation, right? Yes. So until you sin, <clears throat> before you sin, is there any reason for God to be angry and upset and any reason for him to grieve over a sin you haven't committed? No, but shouldn't he know that we are going to What has that got to do with knowing something and something becoming a reality? So he should already be angry with you before you've actually done it? No. So why should he be angry with you today for a sin you're going to commit tomorrow? yeah are you with me or no yes i am okay so should god be angry with you today before you watch it no you know so number one learn about the the god of the bible the god of the bible is not sterile he is not emotionless he's a real being because our emotions come from him he created us with our emotions so he gets angry he's a jealous god he rejoices he he is glad, he loves, but he gets angry, can be grieved and disappointed. So in this context, it's showing that God was grieved over the condition of man. But there are passages where the word nacham can mean that God changed his course of action, changed his decision. Now, this actually proves that God is consistent. Let me explain what I mean. Open up 1 Samuel 15. Guy, he, guys, he asked an excellent question. If you don't listen, you're not going to learn. I hope you're learning because we're going to go for your, maybe another 20, 30 minutes, Lord willing. 
but learn because this question it was going to come up and you got to learn what the bible says about the character of god you got to learn about what the bible says about the character of god so you can have an accurate view of what the bible teaches about our god he's real and he really involves himself with us because he loves us he's not distant and indifferent and sterile he really loves us and he really interacts with us on a personal level where your actions impact him but if you haven't committed an act then there's nothing for god to react to if you haven't done anything you see so he may know you're going to do it tomorrow but until you make it a reality what's there for him to react to okay now first samuel chapter 15. okay you ready yes now the same word nacham is used in these three verses now pay attention guys first samuel 15 same word used it's nacham in hebrew in hebrew in these three passages but now notice how the meaning changes because a word can have a range of meaning right yes amen lotus praise the lord brother may god continue to empower me to repeat myself more than once so it can sink, sink in and the holy spirit empower you to understand for the glory of the father son lord jesus christ and the holy spirit okay now first samuel 15 29 Yep. Read that for me. And also the strength of Israel will not lie nor repent. Okay, you see the word repent? Yes. That's the word nacham. Does God repent or not? Uh, yes. No, it I... says he does not repent. Okay. Reread again, man. Pay no. attention. And also the strength of Israel will not lie or nor repent yet. Okay, so does God lie? No. Does he repent? No. But I thought he does repent because it says Nacham, right? Same word, guys. So here it says, God does not repent Nacham, right? Yes. You're getting it. You got to get it because I'm helping you answer the Mormon. Mm -hmm. You got it, right? So God does not Nacham repent. Everyone oh. got it? 1 Samuel 15, 29. But then in 1 Samuel 15, 11, the same chapter, it says God does Nacham. Same Hebrew word. Read 1 Samuel 15, 11. It repenteth me that I had set up Saul to be king for he, yeah. For okay, you he... confuse me. 1 Samuel 15, 11, God says, it repenteth me that I made Saul king. Mm -hmm. But then in 29, it says God doesn't repent. So you mean in the same chapter, same word is used so that the author is contradicting himself? No. But now read 35, 1 Samuel 15, 35, because I'm going to explain it to you. All right. And Samuel came no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul, and the Lord repented that he had made Saul king over Israel. So in 1 Samuel 15, 11 and 35 says, God, Nacham, he repents. Yes. But in 29, it says, God does not, Nacham, does not repent. Yep. There is no contradiction because the term Nacham, guys, this is how words function. Words have a range of meaning. The context will determine what meaning applies in a particular context. So in 1 Samuel 15, 29, when it says God will not Nacham, mean God does not change his character, his nature, his purpose. In the grand scheme, God's purpose will ultimately prevail and he'll accomplish it. But in 11 and 35, their Nacham means God was grieved. God was displeased making Saul king because Saul disappointed God. So it has two different meanings. In 1 Samuel 15, 11 and 35, the meaning there is that God was grieved. God was disappointed. God was hurt over Saul's rebellion. He grieved the fact that he made such a such a person a king who ended up rebelling and disobeying God, right? Yes. But in 30 and 29, the meaning is God's purpose and nature will not change. God remains immutable in nature, and God's purpose will always stand because even though circumstances change god will still accomplish his purpose in spite of the choices people make because he can work through those choices to bring about his perfect will understand yeah i got it 
Okay, but now let me show you how this proves that God is consistent. You with me there? Let me show you why. Because, okay, go to Jeremiah 18, 5 to 12. Now you're going to see how this shows that God's nature is perfect and that God reacting to what you do shows he's consistent and his nature doesn't change. What do I mean? Okay, now go to Jeremiah 18, 5 to 12. Yes, I'm looking at it. Now watch here how this actually proves that God is consistent. His nature remains steadfast. His nature is immutable. And therefore, because his nature does not change, God reacting to what you do is actually proof that his nature does not change. Where am I, 18? 5 okay. to 12, right? Yep. I'm looking at it. Go ahead, read it. Well, you got to read it. I can't read your heart. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, O house of Israel, cannot... Holy and loudly so we can follow you. Okay. <laughs> then the word of, of the Lord came to me saying, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter? So if the Lord, behold, as the clay is the potter's hand, so are ye in my hand, O house of Israel. Yep. At what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy it. Yep. If that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. Pause. Okay. Did you catch what God just said? Yeah. He says, if there's a nation that I have threatened to destroy because of their wickedness, Yes. And that nation then repents. Then I will repent from destroying them. I will relent. I will hold back and not destroy them. So God changed his course of action and changed his mind, right? Yes. But that actually proves that God doesn't change. Let me let me show you what I mean. Now look how ironic it is. If a nation is wicked, and God wants to destroy it for its wickedness, but it repents and becomes righteous. And God goes ahead and destroys it anyway. That means God is not consistent with his character because God does not desire the wicked to be destroyed, but the wicked repent and live. So if he didn't change his mind and relent from destroying them after they repented, that means God is acting inconsistently. Oh, okay. You got what I said or no? Yes. You guys, un you understood it, right? I understand. If God, what? I understood. Are you sure? Because if God says, you, William, I'm going to destroy you because you're wicked, because you're going to watch porn, and I'm disgusted with you. Okay. But then you cry out for mercy and ask God for forgiveness, and you don't do it, and God destroys you anyway. That means God is now being inconsistent, and he's going against his nature, which says that if you repent, I will forgive you because I want you to live. Yes. In other words, God had to relent, change his mind, and not destroy that nation after repented if he's consistent and true to his nature. Okay, that makes sense. But now finish the rest of the part. We're not done yet. Okay. And... Um... And at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plan it, if it do evil in my sight and that it obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. Okay, catch what he just said. But if there's a nation, nation, nation that's righteous in my sight and doing good, and I say, I'm going to now prosper you and bless you, because you're righteous, but then it turns away from its righteousness and engages in wickedness and immorality. Then I will repent, relent from the good that I promised to bestow on them. So now, if a nation that's righteous becomes wicked and God continues to bless them, isn't that a sign that God is being unfaithful to his nature and acting contrary to his nature so that his nature is not consistent? No, it's the same thing as the pa the last passage. Uh -huh. In other words, God has to change his course of action and change his will in response to your action if he's going to remain faithful and consistent with his nature. Yep. 
So is it ironic in that these passages where God is repenting or changing his mind or changing his purpose and course of action is actually proof that he's consistent and his nature never changes? Yeah, it is. There you go. There's your answer. Okay. Well, See, I, this I, is why we can't read the Bible on a shallow level. We have to go deep and say, wow, this actually proves that God is consistent. His nature is unchangeable because he can't continue to bless the righteous who become wicked if he's holy. And he can't destroy the wicked if they repent, if he's merciful. So his actions will be dependent on your choices. You're evil because I'm holy. I have to punish you. But if you repent, I will forgive you because I'm merciful.